Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 33. In this video we're going to discuss the ethons. The ethons are essentially the particles that make up the ether. And My name is Robert Justinti. I'm an electrical engineer with 30 years experience. Please go to the channel trailer or video number one if you want to see more about what Ethereum Mechanics is about. Now let's go back to the rule of acquisition number 19. A rule of acquisition is a, stole the idea from the Ferengi of Star Trek and the rules of acquisition help us um, be more careful about how we view science. In this one, rule of acquisition 19 I've changed. It used to be disconnect from the disconnected. Now I've changed it to connect the disconnected. And what does this mean? A disconnection occurs when cause and effect do not occur at the same place and time. For example, that would be any force at distance model because if we take uh, Coulomb's law, if we have a charge over here, and it's going to emit an electric field which affects another charge over here. The problem with it is is that the what occurs over here and what occurs over here happens at different points in, in space. And it, it, we don't have any model that shows how quickly the electric field gets there. So it's not only disconnected in space, it's connect, disconnected in time. And all of these models are disconnected in both space and time. Essentially, if you have a distance, force at distance, that's what these all are. They're both disconnected in space and time. And what rule of acquisition number 19 means, if you have models that are disconnected in space and or time, that you do not have the most fundamental expression of the physical system. All you have basically is an empirical model. And these are empirical models. As what did we do for Coulomb's law? Well, we measured two charges at a distance and, f and calculated the, uh, measured the force. And then we found a mathematical expression which curve fit the data. That's all they are, is empirical models. Every single one of these are empirical models, including relativity. So these models are disconnected because they're force at distance models. They explain how one object affects another at distance and the cause and effect happen at different points of space, so they're disconnected in space. And they do not explain how the effect propagates through space or how fast, so therefore they're disconnected in time. They're useful, but they're not the final word. And why have we not had a light model? One, some people ask me why new electromagnetism has never had a model for light. And the reason why is because all of these force models, including the classical ones, are force at distance. In other words, we have an electron. Let me, suppose we have a little box here. And this box had some kind of fluid in it, okay, and a little plunger over here represents a charge. Once I push down on this charge, or whatever we call it, then some disturbance travels through the box and it makes this other charge go up and down over here. Well, we can't develop a wave model unless we can get at and model the actual fluid that transmits the wave. We cannot make a wave model from the endpoints. We can infer a wave model but we can't derive a wave model from the endpoints. And that's what Maxwell did, and that's why he got it wrong. You go to videos two and three to find out why that was bogusly wrong. And why engineers are using a wave model e to the j omega, okay, which is a wave model for a medium, which works better than Maxwell's equation, which is not a wave model for a medium. So propagation models require knowledge of the medium. That someone can massage constants to obtain the speed of light does not prove they've derived the model for light. Okay, and again, do not derive theory from observations. In other words, we can't derive light from these empirical models because they're just empirical models. All the other wave models that were developed were developed because we knew the tension in the medium and the mass per unit area of the medium and we're modeling it based on an in, a microscopic point of the medium, not by looking at the endpoints. We don't have never developed the wave model that way. But whatever wave model you come up with still has to explain how the endpoints behave. Okay, so that's why rule of acquisition 10 is important here. Okay, so whatever is developed for ethereal mechanics must also predict the same behaviors now comes that new electromagnetism does. It must also predict the outcome derived for ether flow, acceleration, viscosity derived in the non-electric phenomenon. And we must explain how th uh, and through what the effects propagate, you know, for both electric and non-electric ether effects. And the, the non-electric ether effects are the 
stuff we did as far as planetary orbits and black holes and all that stuff. So how do we go forward? Lucky for us there is an anomaly. And rule of acquisition number five says where there is pain there is gain. And the anomaly is transverse waves. Transverse waves you say. Well, for all known medium, transverse waves only occur at the boundary of two media. For example, transverse water waves occur at the boundary between water and air. Transverse string waves at the boundary of the string and the air. I mean, you can't get transverse waves underwater unless you have cavitation. But, you know, other than that, you know, but that if you have cavitation, you basically have two medium. You have the water vapor, which is created from the cavitation, and the water, so you have two medium. So the only way you can get transverse waves in water is if you have two medium. So how do we get transverse waves in ether? Well, electrical engineering to the rescue. Electrical engineers are told, in order to optimize the transmission of energy into a communication channel, and that can be any kind of channel including smoke signals, you have to match the properties of the channel. So, come on dude, move off please, thank you. So, how do we match energy into air, into space? Okay, well we use a dipole antenna. And a dipole antenna radiates by separating charges and alternately making one pole positive and the other one negative and then switching it back and forth. If this is matching the behavior of space and transverse waves can only occur at a boundary between two mediums, then it follows that a transverse radio wave is similar to a separation of charges that propagate through space. So therefore we have to conclude the ether must be a binary medium similar to electric charges. Thanks, Mr. Flip. You've came in at perfectly the right time. Okay, so I gotta push you off, guy. I'm sorry. Thank you. So what I'm calling the, the charges for the ether, I'm calling them ethons. And since we surmise that the ether is comprised of positive and we're gonna we're gonna surmise that the ether is comprised of positive and negative particles, not necessarily electric charges, and we're gonna call these ethons. These ethons convey all known field effects, but they do not have a field because they are the fields. And the following symbols are represented. We're going to use a purple uh, for negative ethons, and we're going to use, well, it's kind of like orange-yellow for positive ethons. I think that's more supposed to be more of an orange. So in the next videos, once I get my cat out of the way, I'll show you how ethons unify gravity with electricity in the next videos. It's, and I'll show you it's so simple that a physicist can do it. No more voodoo physics. Please subscribe if you can. Give me thumbs up and get the word out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flip.